Hello, AP Environmental Science students. Today, um, I'm going to discuss Unit 1, Topic 1.3, the aquatic biomes. Um, instructional purpose for today is for you to be able to describe the global distribution and some of the principal environmental aspects of aquatic biomes. We're going to be talking about freshwater uh, biomes as well as marine biomes. So to begin with, uh, what is a biome? Remember our last uh, conversation, 1.2, where we talked about on land, biome is a region of, globe, of the globe that shares similar characteristics. And those characteristics usually have to do with latitude, um, which determines temperature, um, but it also includes precipitation patterns, weather patterns, um, and we can identify those uh, biomes fairly easily by looking at vegetation and what animal communities exist there. Well, in the water, it's slightly different. Um, light availability plays a big factor, and that not only has to do with latitude, but also it has to do with depth of water. Um, it also uh, is impacted by temperature, and we're going to talk about uh, different biomes and that have remarkably different temperature gradients. Um, currents and tides also play a big factor as weather um, our air shed moves moisture throughout um, our terrestrial biomes and influences those. Uh, in turn, the currents and tides are a big player in nutrients, uh, how they cycle through those systems and um, temperature and salinity. Okay, so the major biomes, aquatic biomes that you will need to know, um, we're gonna start with lodic systems. Lodic system is a moving water system which can be divided into three zones. This is a stylized model of uh, what could be a watershed um, in, say, uh, the Rockies or somewhere in mountainous region um, where you can have distinct zones such as the source zone, which is a shallow, cold, clear, fast flowing stream, usually high dissolved oxygen because of the turbulence, uh, fast moving water over rocks, aerates very quickly. Usually it's very low in uh, nutrients and in primary production. In the middle is this transition zone. The stream starts to wide out as uh, the confluence of different streams come together. Uh, the water warms up as it uh, loses velocity, uh, less dissolved oxygen, and more primary production. Lastly, we can find um, in some watersheds floodplain zone in which uh, the stream really widens. Think of like the Mississippi, where it really gets wide, uh, warm temperatures, high turbidity, and turbidity has to do with the, the amount of sediment in the water, has the least amount of dissolved oxygen, um, and that's because of all that organic matter that's breaking down in there, and also, uh, again, the velocity is, is reduced, and it has the highest net primary production. So we're talking about systems that fall within a watershed or a drainage basin. And that is an area of land that drains uh, runoff sediments and dissolved substance into a stream, river, or wetland. This is really important here in Madison. Uh, our Yahara lakes are heavily influenced by the watersheds in which they are uh, in and the uh, human activities in around those watersheds. We're gonna be talking about those uh, throughout the semester. Um, and inputs of nutrients and what impact they have on our lakes. So ponds and lakes. Um, here there's a picture of our lakes. That's Lake Mendota and Monona. And uh, lakes are lentic versus lodic. They are not moving. And there are two distinct types of lakes. One is the oligotrophic, which is a deep, steep bank lake usually uh, found uh, either in higher mountains or in areas like northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota. Um, they're fairly deep and clean. They have low nutrients and low uh, net production, or production. In contrast, eutrophic lakes, which we're very uh, familiar with here down in southern Wisconsin, shallow, high turbidity, high nutrients, um, but they have a higher net primary production. In fact, not just in primary production, but also throughout the through the whole trophic uh, pyramid produces a lot more biomass of things like fish uh, in those systems. Um, 
So when we look at a lake, um, we're looking at three distinct areas again. One is the littoral zone, so that's usually right on the banks of the lake, have lots of light, high not, uh, net primary production. This is uh, rooted plants um, and lots of biodiversity. Um, in the middle, you have a limnetic zone, which um, also gets lots of light, lower nutrients, um, usually lower net primary production. Types of plants that exist here are things like floating plants and algae. Um, and in the bottom, you are near the bottom or in the middle of a lake, you find what's called the profundal zone, which is low light, low net primary production. And lastly, the benthic zone. And the benthic zone is where all the decomposition is happening, uh, consequently very low dissolved oxygen and no sunlight. All right, so uh, one ecosystem that's really important to recognize in freshwater uh, biomes are inland, the roles of inland wetlands. Um, wetlands have historically been considered wastelands. Uh, they've been filled, they've been drained, and pretty much eliminated through um, most, of the, most of the areas they were um, prior to colonization and settling. Uh, Madison, in fact, um, a city was built pretty much on top of wetlands. So wetlands, what are they doing? You can see in this model um, that wetlands play a huge role in filtering water. Um, and they can do that by slowing down the energy of the water uh, runoff um, and causing the sediment to drop, um, trapping those nutrients, trapping carbon. Um, and plants can play a big role in absorbing um, pollutants, uh, nutrients. Uh, they also are very important in providing habitat um, to lots of organisms, migratory waterfall being an example. So services, filtering toxic water, reducing flooding, uh, sustaining the stream flow, slowly releasing water um, into streams, uh, recharging, that means to add to groundwater supplies, and those aquifers are located pretty far down. Uh, sometimes, you know, miles in the case of our aquifer here in Madison. Um, they provide habitat for lots of things. They have recreational values um, and they are um, supplying some products. Um, and we, for example, ha harvest uh, wild rice here in our state of Wisconsin um, and cranberries. Okay, so now we're going to talk about marine ecosystems. As we know, most of the earth is covered by salt water. There's several biomes that exist in the ocean. Um, the ocean can be divided into five main zones. Uh, the first one is the intertidal zone, and that's where there are lots of nutrients, uh, typically pretty high biodiversity. Um, coastal zone, uh, similar to the littoral zone we talked about in lakes, um, but usually pretty harsh conditions um, in that there's lots of waves, um, periodic drying. Um, so organisms really have to adapt to that environment. Consequently, there is a lower biodiversity. Um, euphotic uh, located out in the middle, um, similar to the limnetic zone, lots of sun, but got, uh, usually lower nutrient levels, consequently lower biodiversity. Um, baffle zone is very similar uh, to the profundal zone, low light, uh, low net uh, primary production. And then lastly, the abyssal uh, zone. And the abyssal zone is similar to the benthic zone we talked about in lakes. No light, very little productivity. However, very important, and we are discovering lots of um, ecosystems down in the abyssal zone um, and biodiversity. Um, because it's so remote and very difficult to get to. Um, and we're discovering the role of oceans in storing nutrients and cycling uh, carbon um, and really understanding all the way through uh, down to the abyssal is, is really important. All right, so ecosystems to remember um, in marine systems, um, estuaries. So an estuary uh, in this picture you can see um, a, a river flowing into the ocean. Um, they are some of the most biodiverse biomes on earth. Um, certainly they are the most productive, um, one of the most productive rivaling rainforest in terms of bi uh, biomass and net 
primary production. They get lots of nutrients coming from uh, the freshwater streams and rivers, uh, sunlight, and also uh, contributions from tides. So very productive. Um, we call this these areas brackish. That's where salt and freshwater mix. And you can get lots of variation in salinity depending on tides and depending on where you are within that estuary. Um, it also includes a very important uh, ecosystem called uh, mangrove forests. Um, and those are usually located in places like the Caribbean, um, down in South America, dominated by mangrove trees, which are adapted to living in salt water. Um, they create very important breakers uh, for storms, those ecosystems. Um, and they look like this. Um, so here you see a picture of mangrove forest. Pretty cool if you've never seen them. Um, they have these extensive roots um, that can be exposed to the, to the air um, so they can do gas exchange. Uh, really important habitat for um, small fish to hide. Um, and uh, as mentioned, very important in protecting uh, coastal areas. Okay. Another uh, ecosystem that I'm sure you're familiar with are intertidal zones. If you've ever been to the beach um, and you walk along and you find rocks um, and you find uh, mussels and barnacles and starfish, um, this is a narrow area between coastlines. Um, usually there are tides that come and go. Um, habitat can vary from sandy, uh, depending on where you are, to really rocky. Um, pretty difficult place to live abiotically um, because of the tides changing and the wave action. So species have to be adapted to those harsh conditions. Um, so um, coral reefs, probably one of the most important and, and one to really key on, on in terms of marine ecosystems. And we're going to be talking about some of the threats to coral reefs, very warm, shallow seas. Um, Unlike many areas that are kind of in this, uh, in the, around the coast, uh, usually lower nutrient levels um, and actually can be susceptible to too much nutrients. Um, important thing to remember biologically is that coral is uh, not one species, but actually two species. Coral has, um, it's a related to uh, things like sea urchins um, and similar biologically, um, but then inside them they have um, symbiotic algae, kind of like the um, lichen that I mentioned in the last uh, lecture. And they those two function together because the algae provides nutrients and the mouth uh, of the uh, coral can actually consume food as well and provides a habitat for the algae. Um, very productive ecosystems, very biologically uh, rich, um, but they are um, susceptible to climate change and bleaching. And that's what's going on in this image here. Um, coral can, uh, because of things like, uh, we're going to talk about acidification of the ocean, which is uh, too much CO2 getting into the, the water, uh, producing acids. Um, and uh, climate change itself. Um, and once coral dies like this um, and ejects its symbiont, it's very difficult to um, come back. So we're gonna be talking about some of the major threats to coral reefs in the future. So here's a picture of kind of what that coral um, animal looks like um, in its structure. It kind of looks similar to something like a sea urchin if you've ever seen those. Okay, so to recap, there are major factors that influence aquatic biomes, light availability, water depth, water temperature, dissolved oxygen content. We're going to be talking more about that with freshwater ecosystems, nutrients availability. Um, don't forget that lakes and ponds come in, four, in two types and are divided into four zones. Streams and rivers are divided into those three zones. Uh, the ocean environment divided into five and shares similarities with lakes and ponds. Um, estuaries are very productive and very biologically diverse. Um, and that pretty much, and coral reefs, sorry, are very valuable and under threat. So that kind of wraps up this uh, 1.3.